Hello, welcome and a happy new year. We're in North Africa for this episode of the podcast. In late 1942, the Allies landed in Morocco and Algeria. This was Operation Torch. With them landed elements of what would become the British First Army, comprising of British, French and American troops. It was commanded by Lieutenant General Kenneth Anderson, a doer, capable Scotsman. First Army would be tasked with moving east, pushing the Germans back into Tunisia with the goal of capturing Tunis. After a 500 mile advance, the Allies reached what would become known as Longstop Hill with its surrounding peaks, a natural upland barrier. To guide us through the battle, I'm joined by historian Ian Mitchell. Ian has been piecing together the battle over the last nine years and laid it all out in his book, The Battle of the Peaks and Longstop Hill. It is a crucial battle of the campaign, which now seems to get overlooked. But before we get started, it's a big thank you to all those who have supported the podcast this last year by becoming patrons. A dollar or so from people like you, loyal listener, help me find the time to put the show together. You can find out more at patreon.com slash ww2 podcast. I really do value your support and when it's possible I do try to make available extra bits and bobs exclusive for patrons. A bit more World War II chat as it were. So that's patreon.com slash ww2 podcast. Ian, thanks for joining me. So we're in North Africa and the crucial fight for Tunisia, led by First Army, pushing East and Montgomery with the Eighth Army pushing uh, West. First Army really don't get much of a mention in the histories. Who are who are the First Army? Who's the British First Army? The First Army was established literally upon landing in Algiers on the eighth of November, nineteen forty-two. Prior to that, it was called Force One One Zero. It really wasn't an army when they landed at Algiers, in Algiers in, in Algeria. It really consisted of two infantry brigades. Uh, but it was formed from the British units that were going to be involved in the Tunisian campaign, uh, also from uh, some French units, later French units, and uh, the American Second Corps. But much of that didn't really happen until about December, because what what we... See in Operation Torch, of course, is the three landings: one in, one, two in Morocco, and one in Algiers. The one in Algiers is the furthest east, and it's designed to aid the task of moving rapidly to take Tunis, the capital of Tunisia, uh, which is five hundred miles from Algiers. Uh, from Algiers, what when they did invade um, uh, or landed at Algiers, they were trying to l- limit talk of British participation because the units were going to be landing in an area controlled by the Vichy French and the French were not very fond of the British particularly after Tel El Kabir when we sank uh, you know killed about a thousand of their sailors and sank their fleet so one of the elements of the operation was they were trying to minimize talk about an army or at least the British maximise the idea that it was under the Americans on the hope that that would reduce resistance from the Vichy French. So is that why we get a first army with uh, American and British troops? It's a combination. First of all, I think there's an element of what forces are available. Uh, Secondly, certainly the idea of of emphasising the American side is to reduce resistance. Uh, And and the other element uh, is, is... that the forces are available, you know, land in Morocco. There's two major landings in Morocco, and then only the 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 the, the landing in Algiers is split between the Americans and the British. So it's um, Kenneth Anderson who leads for, uh, First Army. Who's he? He's certainly not an officer that uh, uh, for leading an army that I, I, I previously encountered. No, I mean Kenneth Anderson is one of the most overlooked. Um, Army commanders, probably the most overlooked army commanders of the Second World War. He comes from humble beginnings. His father was a 
railway engineer in India, and that's where he was born. And they must have had some money in the family because they were able to send him to Charterhouse. And subsequently, he went to Sandhurst and was commissioned in the uh, the Seaforth Highlanders, a regiment that no longer exists in 1911. As a lieutenant and a captain, he then went with an interesting that was an interesting fact I hadn't discovered before and uh, before this conversation. Uh, he actually went to the Western Front with an Indian division in uh, about 1915, where he won a military cross uh, and was seriously wounded on the first day of the Somme. He, like uh, lots of his uh, contemporaries, he then had a rather long period of time getting promoted because in the interwar period, although comparatively uh, as an officer, he did pretty well compared to some of his peers who really had very slow promotion. He didn't do too badly. He went to staff college in Quetta in India, where a gentleman called Percy Hobart, who later became quite famous because he created something called the Funnies, which were uh, armoured engineer vehicles. And his uh, sister also happened to be married to Montgomery. He was um, running the staff college. His opinion of Anderson is interesting and uh, it's worth quoting it. He said of Anderson, it's questionable whether he had the capacity to develop them much, which was um, interesting from Percy Hobart. Uh, but uh, uh, there you go. That's what he said. And there, there, were, there, there are some quotations about that Anderson was 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 quiet and uh, which was certainly one of his characteristics. So Anderson then continues through the interwar period, commands his battalion, commands a brigade. Uh, and in the France in 1940, he's commanding a brigade in uh, the BEF. Uh, when Montgomery takes command of the Corps, he replaces Montgomery for a few days in charge of the 3rd Infantry Division. Uh, uh, but not for very long before they evacuate from Dunkirk. But his progress actually um, through the system shows that his senior commanders, or those that were he reported to, must have thought quite highly with him because he's he's got quite rapid, relatively rapid promotion for the interwar period. Well, it did occur to me that he has a lot of imperial postings. If that's an aid, if you're quite willing to... He's all. He is he's a classic soldier of the empire. He seems to have been posted across everywhere. Yeah, I mean, he, he spent a lot of time in the UK, but he did command his battalion um, on the northwest frontier and did quite well there. He is the fourth choice for command of the first army. That's an interesting fact. It starts out with a gentleman that also the people have forgotten about, mainly because he really wasn't in action. A gentleman called Lieutenant General Schreiber was supposed to be the commander of this Force 110 and the First Army, but he became ill. The next person that was selected was General Alexander, uh, and the next person after him was a gentleman called Bernard Montgomery. But Bernard Montgomery was sent to the Middle East, just like Alexander. Monty was sent off to command the First Army because Gott had been shot down. Uh, and so the fourth choice to command the First Army is uh, Lieutenant General Kenneth Anderson. Uh, and there is a there is a story, uh, I think it's in Mark Clark's bio, uh, autobiography, where Eisenhower is reputed to have said, I hope the turnover of, general, of generals in command of the First Army starts to slow down a little bit. <laughs> Because we've had three in four weeks, so let's hope this one's a keeper. Uh, so th there's Anderson. He's appointed then to command the force that is going to uh, attack Northwest Africa in Operation Torch. Um, and he's an interesting chap. He's not your classic general. He's not this loud, um, rather outgoing gentleman. Uh, he's introverted. Um, he's loyal. He's modest. And he's quiet. Those, I think, are his strengths. Um, his weaknesses, I think, are he's rather shy. He's not a man who tends to sort of project himself like Montgomery does. There is a view that he's cautious and that he's worried, get worries too much over details. Um, Eisenhower, who, of course, was his commander in Tunisia, describes him later as a gallant Scot devoted to duty, absolutely selfish, honest and straightforward, but he could be blunt at times. 
I think that's that's not a bad assessment. I think the problem with Anderson is that he has a very long list of detractors, all of which had uh, uh, political and historical agendas for being detractors, because I think they were trying to pass off problems and make them appear as if it were all Andersons, although Anderson undoubtedly on occasions might have been responsible. And there is this contrast between this argument about Anderson's fitness for command and Anderson's rather inconvenient historical record, which is that in the final analysis, Anderson's first army was successful uh, and in a relatively short period of time in achieving one of the largest surrenders of Axis forces. In fact, I believe it, it actually it is even higher than that that conducted at Stalingrad. So a quarter of a million Axis troops eventually surrendered in North Africa. And Anderson and the First Army played a key role in that. So let's get to this fighting in, um, well, it's, 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 it's a, they're pushing in, as I said, they're pushing in from the uh, west. And there's an upland, is it upland area, hills? I didn't quite know how to describe this area because I, I was looking at the pictures and it, it's not... You have these German mountain troops, but it doesn't strike me as say, if you said mountains, it's disingenuous. You can't really say rolling countryside. You know what? What is this terrain like? That they're, they're it's, it, how far outside of Tunisia is it? It's it's, it's the a natural barrier outside of Tunisia, isn't it? Yeah, I think what you if you if you in terms of trying to understand the terrain, there, there's uh, the the road east from Algiers to to Tunis goes through some r rugged hills and valleys. As it approaches Tunis, there's a road that runs from a town, small town called Uizaga through a larger town called Mejez el Bab, which in Arabic stands for the Gateway, and finally to Tunis. Mejez el Bab is located about 25 miles from Tunis. So in geographical terms, we're looking at a location that is 25 miles from the capital city of Tunisia, uh, on the, in the northern part of that country. Uh, and the road provides a very convenient little southern boundary to the area that we're largely talking about. To the north of that road is an area that spans about uh, 20 miles uh, long by about 8 to 10 miles deep. And this is an area that is still today very rugged, quite difficult to get into which consists of about uh, 10 hills that are over 10, 2,000 feet. So from our point of view in England, for instance, we'd call them mountains or peaks. Some people in America who live in the Rockies would probably call them well, little bumps in, 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 on the plain. It, it's a matter of perspective. It is a isolated, rugged area of terrain with deep cutting valleys, uh, limestone crags, very rugged. There's a useful description which i think i've got somewhere this is from a gentleman called john horsfall who um, was a company commander in the irish fusiliers and later wrote three really excellent books as, as memoirs of his time uh, in the army but he described it as it was so foul broken blasted and inhospitable the devil himself was surely the principal agent in its creation yeah. so th this really isn't the the uh that that desert war with men in men in shorts and sands in their boots i mean there's actually grass and r rain rain was something else that uh that crops up you know th th this is a very different north africa than what we're you know th what we picture from ice coal and alex oh absolutely there's no large rolling sand dunes no flat area this is rugged mountainous terrain the weather ranges from hot in the summer in the winter, mud is a, is a significant issue because the roads are limited, are few. There are only two railway lines, for instance, running from, the, from Algeria to, 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 to the Tunisian area in Tunis, which is an issue to do, creates an issue with logistics. And certainly, for example, the, the first attempt to seize Tunis in, in December 1942 effectively comes to an end for two reasons. One is the German resistance, and secondly as much as anything else because of the weather and the, and, and the difficulty the rains bring in November, December. That, that's to a certain degree still 
the case today, although, of course, there are much more modern highways. Uh, and, and, and as I wrote in my notes, which is, is, which is seemingly something littered throughout this, a, a, a cricket reference, rain stopped play in December. <laughs> yeah, a- absolutely. And cricketing, of course, is a theme that slightly runs through the Battle of the Peaks because in the 78th Division, there are a lot of sportsmen in command positions who have many of them who have got cricketing backgrounds. Yeah, so even down to Longstop Hill is a reference to uh, the chap behind the wicket, isn't it, in cricket? Yeah, it's a position, I'm, I'm told by General Howlett, who wrote the preface to my book, who is the son of one of the brigade commanders in in, uh, in this battle, that uh, Longstop is a specific term that relates to a position on the outfield uh, where you can stop balls that have been hit by batsmen. I hope that's his, uh, I am repeating his, uh, his words, because I know, sadly as a Yorkshireman, I know nothing about cricket. Uh, and the person who coined that phrase was a gentleman called William Wilberforce, who was the Lieutenant Colonel in command of the 1st Battalion, the uh, East Surreys. And of course, Wilberforce is a famous name, and he, he was the great-great-grandson of the anti-slavery or anti-slave trade campaigner. The, the December attack goes in. Now, the, the, the... This is a crucial position for the Germans, presumably, because we're, what, 20, 25 miles from Tunis, which is really their last major tour hold um, on that side of the Mediterranean, isn't it? Yeah. One of the things that people seem to forget when they criticise Anderson is that with effectively less than a division between November the the 8th or whatever it was when they landed and December when they got it, uh, early December, late November they got into at northern Tunisia, he'd managed to move 500 miles d- despite all the obstacles that he faced. And as you quite rightly point out, this is this is an important position on the road from Medjaz el Bab to Tunis. There aren't that many other positions where they can stop uh, a future, you know, an Allied attack. The Allies had at one point in time, for instance, got as far as close as about 17 miles from Tunis. Indeed, there's a story that they could actually see the spires of Tunis. So the Germans are defending this position that's called Longstop Hill. And I think it's important to stress that this is not just one hill. Uh, And this is an important factor that, in fact, leads to problems later. Longstop Hill is a hill complex. Uh, There are two particular peaks. One is called Jebel El Ahmara. I think I've got the Arabic right. And the other one is called Jebel Ra. Between them is a col. Uh, a saddle uh, in geographical terms but there are some outlying uh, hills as well and then to the north to their north uh, they're overlooked by peaks uh, a series of peaks one of which is called Jebel al Tangucha uh, so you've got a, a mountain range behind it and then you've got hills that are about a thousand feet as well uh, but you have a hill complex that consists of two hills one of the problems that happened in the first attack uh, at Longstop is that the Coldstream Guards and the Brigade Commander seemed to think that this was just one hill, one, that if you seized the the hill, that was it. Unfortunately, that's not it, because you can take Jebel Amara, but with a saddle between it and Jebel Ra, it means that you haven't actually, you're vulnerable to counterattack, and of course, that's exactly what happened. If we look at that December uh, attack is because they do actually make it to the top of Longstop and they do actually take it. Is that what happens? They they just there's just not they don't take enough to hold it. The plan is to take Jebel Amara, uh, well take Longstop Hill because as we said they they assume that they know the geography and they don't. The the Coldstream Guards will uh, attack the hill, then hand over to uh, an, an American infantry battalion the 18th Infantry, 2nd Battalion, if I recall correctly, and do that, would you believe, in the middle of the night? I can tell you as a soldier that one of the worst things you could possibly do is carry out a relief in place, that means that you hand over, uh, with a foreign unit in the middle of the night. Uh, That's not a good sound plan. The Coldstreams managed to take Jebel Amara, but not Jebel Ra, so... In that sense, you're not completely correct when you say that they were taking Longstop Hill. And, and I, I can't stress enough that the separation of the two peaks or the two heights is really important. Because you take Jebel Amara, then you suddenly realise that you've got a, a dip 
and then you've got another hill right in front of you. And if the enemy's holding that one, then your hold on uh, the, the Jebel El Mara is precarious at best. Uh, you know, they're, they are thrown off, though. Is that just they didn't appreciate how much the Germans were going to you know, put in an effective counterattack? Or did they, were they just worn out after that 500-mile gallop and they didn't have any more to throw in? Well, the, 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 the Coldstrings were, hadn't really been involved in the gallop because the 1st Guards Brigade, which is the 3rd Brigade of 78th, Division, which is the major formation that was involved, it was known as the Battle Axe Division because of its divisional sign. They'd come in uh, in the one of the follow-on, or I think it was the second follow-on convoy. So they'd then been brought up without being involved in any action uh, uh, in December. Uh, the The main reason for the loss of the hill was a the Coldstreams took Amara, thought they'd taken the whole thing, handed over to the 18th Infantry. The 18th Infantry didn't realise, in fact, they didn't know about Jebel Rakas, nobody told them, the Germans counterattack because they're prepared for this. In, in, in essence, it's not a great plan. They're pitting one battalion plus another American battalion against uh, a defending unit that's got a battalion that's defending um, Jebel Amara and Ra and is supported by two further battalions. So they're outnumbered before they really, really start. The Germans counterattack, as is their doctrine, as it was in World War Two. They were prepared for it. Also, the attack on uh, Longstop was not a surprise to the Germans. There had been a number of kind of um, things that suggested that they were going to attack. It was not well supported by infantry. All in all, it's not the British Army or the Guards Brigade's finest hour in terms of the plan. But in in, in defence of the Guards Brigade. It's, it's a kind of a divisional plan, and there's a lot of people at division because they've continually passed by that feature who should really have known better and should have been advising them about the fact that there are two peaks. Their intelligence wasn't very good, both at divisional and brigade level. And more importantly, if you're going to seize a feature of this nature, you normally would require a two-to-one superiority, if not more, if you're in a um, an operation where you're going to seize terrain that is likely to be well defended and an enemy that's been in place. Uh, and, and instead, in this occasion, they were effectively, when you strip it down to the essentials, they were sending three companies of the Coldstream Guards against almost one and a half battalions of Germans and without substantial artillery support. And it was therefore not a surprise that the plan failed. What surprised me is, though, for such a key position, there now seems like quite a long layover until the next series of attacks. Is that because they're trying, they're probing elsewhere, they're trying to get in from a different angle? Um, I don't know, I came forward for the first time, uh, interestingly enough, mid to late this it's mid to late December. He he'd spent a lot of time uh, in Algiers, far too much for someone. His first visit, amazingly, to the Tunisian front, I don't think it was until December the 17th. But he then subsequently made the decision that given the strength of the forces that were available, that and along with Anderson advising him, that they could not move forward. Now, the reason for it being held for such a long time, for four months, is that is that there are other things happening elsewhere. Uh, and moreover, of course, you've got the weather, you've got the mud, you've got the winter. The strength of the forces, of course, is not necessarily that well, that equal at the moment. It's only sort of from about mid to late January onwards that the Allies really build up their forces and three new British infantry divisions come in. The Germans have already built up theirs and they're in the position to counterattack between January and February. So Longstop and the Medjez El Bab area becomes a kind of not exactly a quiet area, but it's not the primary focus of operations. And as a result, what you see, of course, are two major counterattacks. One that's conducted in the south at uh, the Battle of uh, Faye Pass and uh, Kasserin, uh, which is more perhaps more famous. And then in the north, the German army under the German Panzer Army under a gentleman called von Arnim, who's your kind of classic Prussian, counterattacks in the north in an operation that's called. Oshenkopf, which means oxen head. Uh, that counterattack happens north of Medjez in an area 
that, that leads to a valley that includes a village called Sidi Nazir. Uh, and there's an epic battle at Sidi Nazir where uh, the 155 battery of the Royal Artillery sacrifices itself uh, with only nine men remaining as they remain, as they stay at their guns to, to stop a German tanker cap. But effectively what we're saying is during the winter, there's a bit of a stalemate, but there are two primary counterattacks, one in the north, one in the south. The one in the south, of course, is quite disastrous for both the, the, the Americans, which everybody tends to talk about, but it also involves some losses for the British as well. Uh, because the British go there to try and reinforce. But the, the counterattack in the south is stopped, as is the one in the north. The one in the north, I think, is, is particularly uh, more costly for the Germans than the one in the south. I, I, I failed to note this down, but it's just popped into my head, was that um, Montgomery has a, has a push from his side and fails to get any traction as well from the, uh, from the west, doesn't he? At this point, Montgomery is, uh, and the 8th Army, having uh, completed the victory at El Alamein, are, are taking time to travel, and it is a long distance, uh, and make sure that they're logistically supported. They then arrive in the southeast of Tunisia, and there are a series of quite bitter battles around the Marath line, and there's a counterattack against Montgomery as well. So Montgomery and the 8th Army are fighting in the southeast to try and link up with, effectively, the 1st Army and the French. I think one of the interesting things is this, that, that Montgomery is, is kind of scathing about Anderson uh, and Anderson's performance as a battlefield commander. He's unhappy when people from the First Army didn't come to attend his personal set of series of lectures uh, where he was going to tell everybody about how he'd won the Battle of El Alamein. One of the contrasting issues, interesting issues, is that Monty had never really had any experience of fighting in mountains. You could argue that he'd been a commander of a division in Palestine, so he'd had a little bit of experience in a sense of counterinsurgency, but he'd never been in India, and in the desert, of course, it was relatively flat, not completely so, but relatively flat. You can see a long way, um, there's pluses and minuses from that from a tactical perspective. He then arrives in southern Tunisia, where he, he and his commanders come up against some quite difficult terrain, uh, and all of a sudden things don't go so well. I think it's an interesting counterpoint for if people you know, sat there thinking, well, if Monty had been there, well, no, actually, Monty came unstuck as well. So. Well, one of the interesting, <laughs> really interesting questions is what ha would have happened if Strafer Gott hadn't been shot down? Uh, he continued to take over the 8th Army, and Monty had been presented with all the obstacles and the challenges that Kenneth Anderson got. An, an army in name only, German air superiority, difficult allies. The French did cause both political and military problems. And dare I say, working for a very inexperienced, and I think that's a reasonable summary, Eisenhower in those circumstances. And of course, given the resources that he had. Uh, and, and no one's ever kind of sort of articulated that but to me it's a really interesting historical question because i don't think monty would have performed very well at all oh perhaps not well let's let's get on to this uh, this attack where they eventually uh you know the, the, the offensive that gets us there when they when they're thinking of uh planning the next offense which you think is april 43 isn't it what what have they deemed uh with their faults what did they what did they decide they'd have to do differently when they uh, are organising their next attack? Um, I think there's a number of elements to what happens in April. Uh, there have been a series of defeats in the First Army uh, between January and March. Part of this is down to uh, tactics. Part of it is down to forces that are available. Um, part of it is down to the experience of the Germans one aspect, of course, is that some divisions are being shifted around a lot with their brigades in various different places. So the first time, for example, that the 78th Division fights as a division is actually in this operation. But the, the key things that I think that are applicable when they're planning uh, the operation, and I'll describe why they needed to do so in a second, are that they carefully understand the terrain they make sure that they also have a good understanding of what the German forces are and where they're located, that they 
give themselves more than sufficient forces to do the job, that they have excellent artillery support in sufficient quantities, uh, and that they have a, a really coherent plan to execute it. And that's certainly what happens in what was known as Operation Sweep, which is this particular series of battles. Now, the, the, the reason they've got to execute this operation is that in February, during that period when I was talking about uh, the uh, Oxenhead operation, the, the heights that overlook the road that leads from from the, the uh, western part of Tunisia through Medjez el Bab to Tunis, those heights that are to the north are taken by the Germans. They go around Medjez el Bab, come in from the north and take the heights, that the hills that overlook the road. That cuts the main supply route that the, the units that are in the Medjez el Bab area were using and they have to bring supplies all the way around uh, and in from the south. They even have to cut a road to do that. So this operation is about three things. One, retaking a road that you need in order to conduct the offensive, the final offensive to go and attack Tunis uh, and, and the logistics side of that. It's about removing the Germans also from the north side of the road that overlooks Longstop, which, as we say, is an important defensive position. Yeah, uh, uh, am I right? It's certainly also... Um... They acquire some of Montgomery's 8th Army units, um, 7th Army. That's later, that later and not during the period of this particular oh, okay. operation. <laughs> the, 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 they transfer, they eventually get round to making the, the very sensible decision, but it takes a long time for it to happen, that Montgomery's attack is go not going to succeed in the south, uh, uh, in the area around Enfiderville. Uh, so they transfer, I think it, for a corporate, it's at least three formations, one of which is the 4th uh, is the fourth Indian Division, the other is the 1st Armoured Division, and I think the 7th, to um, Anderson's Command for the final operation. I've got, I've got that in the wrong place in my timeline. So, Operation operation Sweep, is this where we get the uh, Churchills used? The, the Churchills arrive um, uh, in Tunisia prior to Operation Sweep, but certainly they distinguish themselves uh, subsequently during Operation Sweep. They, they actually arrive around about as part of two armoured brigades, tank brigades, and these are infantry tank support brigades uh, that were designed to support infantry operations, not, uh, not armoured divisions per se, which were really designed around exploitation, mobility. These are therefore close support of infantry uh, operations. And there's two brigades, one's called the 21st, the other one's called the 25th, uh, both of those are largely equipped with the Churchill tank. Which, you know, it strikes me uh, in this situation as being you know, almost a war winner because the Germans don't have, they don't have tanks in the field, yet the, Ch the Churchill seemingly can can manage the terrain and, and, and appear as a surprise to, what, to the Germans. They, they, they certainly appear as a surprise in terms of where they are used in Operation Sweep. The Germans have tanks, but the nature of the terrain in which we're in, there's only one real location where you you can either use them down in on the road to long stop, but that's obviously as a counterattack force. In the, in the area that Operation Sweep took place in, there there is one valley which is called the Bed Valley, uh, the Uud Bed, Uud being the Arabic for for river, uh, and that is one area that 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 you could use them as a kind of a counter-attack force, but the Germans have got a limited number of tanks in northern Tunisia, and they tend to concentrate them south of what's called the Majeda River, and that divides it west to east. It, literally south of that road that I've talked about uh, is a river called the Majeda, I can pronunciation is probably terrible, but it's Majed, the Majeda River. So most of their tanks are actually south of that river. There are a few in the north, but not too many. But the, 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 the Churchill does come as uh, a surprise, primarily because the terrain is very rugged, and when it is used, the Germans do not really expect tanks to be used in the, that area. So they're not really prepared with 
uh, having anti-tank guns or anti-tank mines to stop them operating. Now, before we got started, we did touch upon this. Did you ever come up with an answer of, of why the Churchill was suited to this terrain? If perhaps suited might not be the, the way of putting it, but you could handle this terrain. Well, I think the, the, the key thing that, that I came across, <laughs> and I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on the Churchill, I know a couple of people who are. I think the most important point is that the Churchill is designed to be a tank that can operate uh, cross trenches, move over slopes uh, and be in close support of the infantry when they're assaulting uh, enemy positions. So it's, it's specifically designed around that role. One of the answers is to do with, as I understand it, uh, is to do with the fact that there are, the, the tracks are longer and wider than uh, what would be things, for instance, things like Chir the Sherman, although there were relatively few Shermans at that point available in uh, most of the First Army. They really only had one division at that point, the Sixth Armoured Division, that did have some Churchills. So that the tracks are wider. It's a, it's a bit like a tractor. You spread the load over a wider area of the, 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 the weight of the, ta of the tractor or of the tank. So and you do that by having wider tracks and longer tracks, and the, the Churchill does have long and wide tracks. It's also got 11 bogies as well, which are the things that the tracks run around, and that's more than usual tanks. I'm sure a, a Churchill expert would probably be able to give you the definitive version. Um, I think the other thing to say also is, is it's not just about the Churchill's design. The officers that commanded the units, and particularly one unit, uh, the North Irish Horse, uh, was one of the tank support regiments. They were very innovative in the way in which they trained. So, for example, the North Irish Horse trained somewhere that's, uh, if I look out my window, that's only about 20 miles north of where I live in Wiltshire. And they trained a place called we near Westbury, where they trained, uh, they actually David Dorney, who commanded the, the regiment, insisted that they actually the drivers and the crews got used to going up slopes. They also tended to have this ethos of where the infantry would go, we will go with them. Uh, and, and Dorney started out as an infantryman before he became a cavalryman, before he became, joined the North Irish Horse. And he therefore, it's about uh, the ethos of the unit as well. It struck me as a real can-do attitude to go into this uh, terrain when they're asked to go. They <laughs> they they make an assessment and, uh, 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 and and actually give it give it a crack. So um, how does Operation Sweep? How does it play out? Presumably the Germans show their usual dogged determination. Um, to a degree, they do and they don't. I mean, at, at this point in the war, this area has been held mainly by one division. It's called the three hundred and thirty fourth Infantry or Mountain Division. Uh, so the the battle axe division is pitted la re reinforced substantially is pitted against uh, a rather understrength german division but certainly the germans do defend quite hard in some parts during the operation and in others not so not so not so uh, strongly um on 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 other, other times the the operation pans out i mean it, it's impossible to give the detail but i think it's worth sort of giving a of an overview in a number of phases i'm not going to go into those phases i think that would would be too much but the, 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 i think the important thing is that this operation is about to cut it down to its absolute uh, bare bones is about jebel hopping a jebel is the arab word for a mountain or a hill one of the things that you've got to do in this area of this inhospitable terrain that people talk about is that you can't just seize one hill, because if you seize one hill, it's usually overlooked by another one. And uh, that means that you may have kicked the enemy off one jebel, but basically two other jebels are appearing above you and the Germans can look down on you. So you've, you've got to coordinate your operations so that you take two or three hills at the same time. You hop from one to the other and you actually attack a series of positions simultaneously not one or the other because all that does is enable the enemy to use their artillery uh, and their uh, their weapons to, to stop you moving to the next one so over the period from the 6th of april through to about the 25th 26th of april the 78th division supported by 
the armoured brigade that I told you about and reinforced with a number of other units uh, has to take one hill after another from Germans who are determined to keep their hands on them and who regularly counterattack. Uh, and so what you get is this process of often uh, confusion and chaos in, in the darkness sometimes where you think you've taken a hill and the next thing you know, you've got grenades falling down on top of you from Germans who are counterattacking and you have to scramble to actually hold on to your uh, your positions. It seems terrifically attritional, this, this fighting, with the men never really being rotated out it just doesn't seem to be a you, you, some of these units are really decimated and, and asked to keep going i wouldn't say decimated but it is certainly true that for instance one of the brigades is the 11th infantry brigade which incidentally by the way anderson commanded uh in uh, the bf in france so he's familiar with many of the people in it uh the 11th brigade in it, its series of operations it is eventually gr gradually ground down both its commander, a guy called Copper Cass, and the brigade are kind of ground down by the task of taking one after the other. Uh, one of the units, the Lancashire Fusiliers, obviously well famous for, to do with Gallipoli and the number of VCs that they won before breakfast, is finds itself during one of the attacks on a, on a, on a feature called Jebel Tan Gucha is uh, hit by a counterattack that destroys three companies. So the actual battalion itself is reduced down to about 150 men. That's a particularly bad example of what happens. But the other units as well, for instance, the Irish Brigade, which had replaced the First Guards Brigade in the 78th Division uh, and is heavily involved in this particular battle, it also suffers significant losses as does the 36th Kent Brigade, which is the 3rd Infantry Brigade in the division. Uh, so decimated is not a word that I would absolutely use, but the, the, the casualty rate is significant. Yeah, and I was, I was, uh, well, I was just looking at the Major uh, John Anderson who wins the VC and he gets... Well, tell us about, rather than me telling you, telling you, you know, you tell us about... Uh, I don't know, I might learn something. <laughs> you tell us about John Anderson winning his VC, because it's surprising he pushes on up that hill and gets to the top with, I can't remember how many men he set off with, but he gets to the top with is it four officers and 30 or 40 men by the time he, he, he captures the top of the hill. I mean, the culmination of the battle um, is at two levels. One is in the ridge lines that are above it, which people tend to neglect and that's why I'm mentioning it because those battles are, those actions are quite significant and involve a great deal of gallantry. Uh, they're fighting, for example, against a penal regiment, a penal battalion of the German army. So I, I don't want to skip over those, but I'll focus on Longstop and Anderson now. It's the second attack on Longstop Hill. It's better prepared. Uh, the brigade that carries it out is commanded by Brigadier Howlett, uh, who is the, as I said, uh, whose son I, I have had the pleasure of, is, is, a, is a retired now four-star general. Uh, and, and, uh, and Brigadier Howlett was known as Swifty Howlett because he was a cricketer. We, we talked about the crickety theme and, and, played, and played, for both the, the, played for the MCC, among other people. So he was a fast bowler. I think we can, we can work that one out. So Brigadier Howlett has a reinforced brigade supported by tanks, the North Irish Horse. He has most of the divisional artillery at his disposal. Uh, he has air support because they bomb the German positions on Longstop Hill. And they have a generally not a bad plan. And the plan is to attack at night to seize the hills that are of the approaches to Longstop, which are above and to its north, uh, about um, the sort of uh, 600 metres, 715 metres to a, th a kilometre just to the north. This is not the mountain range, by the way. This is literally the approaches. And then the Argyle and Southern Highlanders, the 8th Battalion of that regiment, uh, which is part, interestingly enough, of a Kent Brigade, uh, will attack in the roundabout 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, and take Jebel um, Amira, which is the first of the two peaks. Because by now they have, after all, worked out that there are two peaks, uh, or two, two hills. Inevitably, no plan survives contact with, uh, with the enemy, and that's not what happens. Uh, the attack bogs down, 
uh, at least part of the attack bogs down. The uh, are not able to take the initial positions leading to a mirror to enable the Argyles to launch their attack at night. And what actually happens is the attack is launched at 11 o'clock in the morning in broad daylight with the Germans looking on. So the Argyles cross a, have to cross a bare plain. It's a, it's a field. Interesting enough, one of the memories that they have, a vivid memory, is it's populated with coloured pretty flowers. Uh, and they move in the open. The Germans, of course, see them from their positions and their forward observers are able to see them. And uh, on top of the attacking three companies descends both mortar and artillery fire. Uh, now, what happens at that point is that uh, the battalion commander of the 8th, who's a new chap called McNabb, who had been Anderson's chief of staff, Brigadier General Staff, and was his chief staff officer, but who'd taken a drop in rank to command the battalion, he and his headquarters team, we call it an O group in the British Army, disappear in a fury of mortar rounds and suddenly McNabb and most of his team are wiped out. So what we now have is a kind of leaderless battalion, its companies being shredded by artillery, mortar and machine gun fire and uh, they're trying to get, they're reaching the bottom of the hill. Anderson is told uh, around about that time, having himself been wounded, that the CO is down so he, he takes over command, not least of which, because two of the company commanders are also wounded as well. Uh, and he leads the uh, what is left of the battalion at that point in terms of the three com three rifle companies up the hill. And when I mean lead, I mean he was one of the first people up the hill and he physically takes out several of the some of the positions. But he's not alone, and I think that's really important. One of the things that accounts of Longstock Hill have not talked about is the role of NCOs in the battle uh, and also some of the officers. It's kind of everybody goes up the ridge at different points uh, and they all take out positions. NCOs take, that were normally in charge of uh, or being sort of part of a platoon end up taking command of a platoon. In one case, in, they take command of a company and all of them display real great leadership. Uh, in, dare I say, the finest traditions of our NCOs in leading their way up that hill. So it is not only Anderson that takes the hill, but it is certainly Anderson's example and his personal leadership, which is mentioned in his VC citation quite rightly, that has a huge impact upon taking uh, the hill. The, there is a story that... Um, I've never managed to pin down how accurate it is, is that when they reach the first ridge on, and it is a ridge that leads to the top of the, to the, the uh, of Jebel El Amira, one of they took some prisoners, and one of the prisoners, for some reason or other we will never know, snatched a machine pistol from some, somewhere and shot several of the Argyles. The Argyles killed him, but that kind of got their blood up because of the fact that you know prisoners aren't supposed to try and uh, shoot people once they've uh, surrendered. Uh, and, it, and it is certainly true that they were in a uh, 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 a pretty fighting mood. Uh, I believe there's a quote in my book that talks about uh, Anderson or somebody who says, we were mad at the Germans and everybody. So Anderson leads the way up the mountain with, with a, a number of his other people involved. He personally attacks with his Thompson machine gun and grenades at least two machine gun posts along the way, knocks them out. So he's, he literally leads people up the mountain and it is a magnificent show of gallantry. It is, it is. And, 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 um, and he, he sadly killed his uh, Major John Anderson in... Um... He's killed uh, at the Battle of Termoli in Italy. The general view, I think, and everything I've read and I've done a little bit of research on it, is that he was actually killed by her own artillery. Uh, at the, there's a brick factory in uh, on the outskirts of Termoli, and the Argyles were being attacked, almost overrun by a German counterattack at Termoli, uh, and and Anderson was killed there. And his and his look uh, his look run out. So, at what point uh, do the Germans end up uh, conceding that they'd lost the uh, battle for the? peaks um well by the time we get to Longstock, um to the north we talked about that mountain range that the irish brigade were particularly involved in taking 
once once you lose that 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 very high range, which is goes up to two thousand feet, which overlooks Longstop, and that's one of the critical parts of reason why we were able to take it because we took the German observation positions and positions above. So that that finishes the Germans retreat further east from there. At that point, effectively, they're relinquishing control of those critical mountain positions, and secondly, of Longstop. Longstop itself falls because the having taken Jebel Amara with Anderson and the Argyles, the East Surreys under William Wilberforce come up to help support them. They retain control of that first um, uh, height. The, the two days later, they launch an attack using the brigade reinforced with the with the with the North Irish horse again, and they take the second peak, which is Jebel Ra. And it's certainly on Jebel Ra that the the Churchill's tanks uh, mobility is demonstrated. Uh, the Germans aren't expecting it to climb literally up on top of the mountain, uh, and that's what happens. And at the end of it, the Germans say, "Well, you know, I don't think I'm going to stand around while I'm being attacked by a tank on top of a hill." So they all surrender. And there's the role of the the the, the regiment that's involved, which is the buffs. So that between the tanks and the the North Irish tanks, which are particularly very mobile, you know, two of them are literally climb up on top of it. That leads to the Germans having to retreat and withdraw. They withdraw further east and take up new positions on the road to um, to Buba and Tunis. And presumably with those hills, the, the major geographical defensive line gone from then on in, they can have a better crack at getting to Tunis. It's not, I, I again, failed to note down the desert. It's not long after that that Tunis falls. Yeah, what we see then is that having significantly, you know, reduced the... the the German forces in that area, and, and also, more importantly, I think, taken really defensible positions in the mountains. What then happens is that, as we you mentioned yourself, is that uh, formations come to reinforce Anderson. Uh, they launch an operation, a uh, wider operation, of which the second, the second Battle of Longstop is part, which is called Operation Vulcan. And then there's subsequently an operation called Operation Strike, which is the one that is commanded by Horrocks, which attacks uh, south of that river that I mentioned, the Majeda River. And that's in the area where the Germans really are expecting it. So there's a kind of attritional battle, one that the First Army and um, uh, Anderson is perhaps better equipped to deal with. That leads to the surrender, in essence, and the capture of Tunis. Now, you point out that you know it's perhaps the you know, the, the, the the greatest surrender of the German army with uh, a quarter of a million men. What happens to Anderson? Why do we not hear of Anderson? Why is he not an army commander in uh, Northwest Europe? Well, he was scheduled to be the army commander of the Second Army, and indeed, when he was brought back from. North Africa in, in the middle to the late of 1943. That was where he ended up. The difficulty was is that uh, going back to the First Army, you had two armies. You had the First Army and the Eighth Army. The traditional explanation is that they only needed one army to invade Sicily, and because of the profile of the Eighth Army and Montgomery, not least of which because Montgomery was commanding it, and Alan Brook, who was at that point, chief of the Imperial General Staff, uh, and therefore kind of head of the army, he wanted Montgomery to lead that. Alan Brooke wasn't a huge fan of Anderson, and while Alan Brooke was undoubtedly a very able CIGS, nonetheless, his relationship with Montgomery was very quite close, uh, and, and Montgomery sometimes, I think, could be argued to over-influence him. Uh, but he selected Montgomery to lead the Eighth Army. Uh, we don't need two armies; we just need one. It's the Eighth Army that gets that privilege. Uh, that didn't actually go down too well amongst many people in the First Army, and there, there are numerous accounts of when various parts of the Seventy Eighth Division joined the Eighth Army, plastered all their trucks as uh, "We're not. We, we don't want to be part of the Eighth Army." So Mon Monty was not as popular as he thought he was. So Anderson he takes a kind of step back, the idea being that he goes off to the Second Army. When Montgomery is brought back in 1944, Montgomery does not think highly of Anderson and he replaces him with Miles Dempsey. So where does Anderson finish the war? Anderson finishes the war as head of East African Command, if I recall correctly. He, he was head of the Second Army up until January and he was involved in 
training it. Monty comes back, you know, gets rid of him. There's an interview with Alan Brook in which Alan Brook says that Anderson, in typical fashion, takes the a rather hard decision uh, with very good grace that is effectively shunted off to East Africa. He becomes governor of Gibraltar, quite a popular governor of Gibraltar from what I understand, uh, and um, uh, after the war, but dies there of pneumonia at the age of 67. So I found a quote about Anderson. He handled a difficult campaign more competently than his critics suggest, but competence without flair was not good enough for a top commander in 1944. What do you think? Is that fair? I know where the quote comes from. I'm not entirely sure that, uh, that it, it's, it's fair. I think the difficult part with Anderson is that Anderson never wrote his own autobiography, unlike Monty, who, of course, was prolific. Prolific in telling us all about how a brilliant command, how great he was. Um, uh, he never kept a diary. And there has never been a biographer. Therefore, I think history has tended to treat Anderson rather uh, uh, poorly. Uh, I believe that he was not a perfect man to be an army commander, but there there weren't that many good ones around, to be honest. He was presented with a really difficult set of obstacles and challenges for which perhaps he was not always completely personally equipped. And he made a really, really good job of him. Monty talks about talked uh, is famously renowned for having said uh, into a very public audience of junior officers rather loudly in Cairo when uh, he was men- somebody mentioned that he was working for Anderson. Monty said, uh, "Oh yes, General Anderson, a good plain cook," which was rather patronising and something that certainly in the army of the nineteen. 19- 40s even today would not expect one general to say to another to say to a junior officer uh so it's really bad form from that point of view but it is typical montgomery my argument would be that anderson was perhaps not the most best suited to be an army commander but that he was actually a bloody good chef (laughs) very good well ian that would seem like a good place to end thank you Loyal listener, if you want to know more, you need to pick up a copy of Battle of the Peaks and Long Stop Hill by Ian Mitchell. It's a good read and there are some great vignettes of the small actions. I will put a link on the website. Well, that's it for now. Don't forget to keep up with the podcast. You can find me on Facebook, WW2 Podcast, or if you fancy joining the gang and becoming a patron, patreon.com slash ww2podcast. I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening.